Hey, this is Dark Days Radio, and this is Darkling episode number 34. I hope that was the right number. All right, we have a bit of an interesting episode tonight. Um, this is going to be pretty much just flying by the seat of our pants because we haven't really prepared anything. And uh, we're just going to touch on a couple of uh, emails we got, uh, some new game ideas and that kind of thing, and just kind of see where the night takes us. So I'm, of course, one of your hosts, Mike, and tonight I'm joined by Chris. How's it going, Chris? Hello. Um, yeah, I'm good. Just been busy recently. All right. And we also have Chig with his new microphone, but he's still in the dungeon. How's it going, Chig? Going pretty well, Mike. All right. Excellent. Excellent. So, just to kick things off, um, should we just kind of like talk about how we haven't been doing any gaming except for Chig? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I haven't been doing anything since uh, before Christmas. So, we, I think the last thing I did was, uh, what, we finished whatever story it was for Iron Kingdoms. And I'm at the point where, when we get back into it, we'll be running parts two and three of Witchfire Trilogy. Um, and also we lost one of our players because he moved country um, but that's not really going to have much influence on the way the game's going it just means they're going to be down a magic user which is kind of dangerous when you lose a cleric from the party and you're basically going to go up against lots of undead oh well mm-hmm. um, yeah otherwise what else have we been doing trying to finish some painting and uh, I'm hoping maybe next weekend I might play some hybrid uh which is a rare as hell uh board game um made by rackham back in 2003 uh and i have um i have the game the expansion and pretty much a good set of miniatures uh for it all and um yeah you know they just don't make miniatures like these anymore no, um, definitely not. So it's going to be good to play because um, I've also got... You can freely download uh, the Cadwallon RPG, which is the same setting that Rackham has, which is Art Clash. Um, and it's a very beautiful... Again, a very beautiful role-play uh, role play game book. Uh, it's maybe a bit too mechanical, I would say, because it's, it's a lot of grid-based movement and so forth. Um hmm. But I think it's a really nice setting that I think you could possibly use a different system for the game. Um, yeah, it's uh, that's it's pretty cool looking, and it's again it's just an example of how Rackham did a lot of how I'd say over designing stuff. Um, you know, like cards had like the the cards in the hybrid have like paragraph upon paragraph of this flavor text on a card which you literally use as just a modifier within the game. And each of the bits of the flavor text tells you something about the story of the, that that the the hybrid game is based on. So it's just ridiculous. It's just overly designed and uh, just shows what Rackham did that unfortunately, you know, caused them to eventually collapse. Um, well, that's not really why they collapsed. Uh, they they well, were notorious for their uh, artistic over-design and their mechanical... They try uh, to expand too quickly. Yes. Was the problem. Yeah. Uh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. So, for those that don't know, Rackham was at one point probably like the big contender against uh, Games Workshop, especially once FASA was kind of like out of the picture. Uh, and they were they were French based uh, miniatures and gaming company. Uh, but they they were so well known for their amazing miniatures and really good, you know, artistic graphical design and that sort of thing. But then they switched to plastic pre painted miniatures. And things went pretty downhill from there. Yeah. Because they lost their, uh, really just their existing fan base, who just really liked those uh, really well-detailed and uh, high-quality miniatures. It's um, it's an example of, it's unfortunate what happened to them. I mean, I hope um, at some point, uh, so Cyanide Studios is the French uh, computer games company that holds the IP for all of that. And they've mm-hmm. brought out a number of games based upon that setting. Uh, there's a board game called Cadwell and City of Thieves, which is done by Fantasy Flight Games. And Cool Mini or Not have under their Legacy Miniatures imprint uh, the license to uh, you know do certain uh, Rackham miniatures. 
and uh, and hopefully you know they're meant to be someone somewhere is meant to be doing a new version of the war game uh you know so sort of got the rights to you know make a new version of the rules a lot of the problem though is that there is a there's a whole there's at least two major uh re uh, the only way to describe it is illegal recasters because these miniatures are so wanted and they are so beautiful to paint that you know they they there are people out there recasting them and that's a, a major problem and you know it's just going to become harder and harder as we get more and more into this digital printing kind of uh, era, uh, the other thing I would say about Rackham, uh, which I find I would I would say the the nearest thing to a parallel to them in this day and age may well be um, Kingdom Death, because mm. back in the day Rackham was kind of you know your boutique miniatures company where you would where you would go I don't give a damn about you know the the game, I just want the pretty miniatures. And the big resin sculpts, and Kingdom Death has the same thing. So, you know, I'll be I'm eager to see how Kingdom Death turns out, and um, it's not long now until I might be able to piggyback the uh, uh, James's uh, pledge as they open up the one last chance to, you know, confirm people's pledges and what they want and get extra stuff, and you know, attach another box game to it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Sounds good. And for myself, uh, not too much role-playing, but I was at TempleCon last weekend, which is a uh, pretty major uh, tabletop Son convention. Son of a bitch. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, really big for... Uh, it, it's actually this kind of hybrid of two conventions where there was a steampunk convention and also a wargaming convention. And they came together um, in the early 2000s. And, you know, just about the same time, there's this new tabletop wargame on the... Uh, on the market called War Machine, which really just took root uh, in this convention. is a pretty big thing. And in fact, Privateer Press gave their uh, kind of press conference keynote speech uh, uh, for the year at TempleCon. So it was pretty huge, a uh, lot of activity with wargaming. But I was actually there for uh, Vampire the Eternal Struggle playing that card game on this secret underground bunker where the uh, tournaments are held for that card game. And it was a very good time. We had, uh, for the uh, qualifying tournament, we had... 24 players so that's pretty major for uh, a card game which isn't really published anymore so definitely a very good time and uh i will happily proclaim that i uh, got one victory point um with my deck so that was that was good nice <laughs> yeah well done it means i at least got one guy down so that was something and chig you've got your own uh, interesting new year's resolution don't you uh, yeah, it's my New Year's resolution to play at least six new uh, systems or settings this year. Uh, my group and I have begun playing, um, I always forget the stinking name. Eclipse Phase? Eclipse Phase, yes. I'm glad somebody remembers what I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, we've uh, done a character generation session, and our first actual play session will be tonight. Nice, so I like it. Uh, what kind of a morph do you have? Um, I am playing one of the almost but not quite better than human morphs um I, we did random character generation so it was all done on the life path role and we all randomly wound up playing the um uh not not the elfin ones but the ones that are uh better than people but not they don't look like people they all have the uncanny valley side effect uh, okay that's pretty neat so uh with the life path yeah. do you know if you can roll up the uh character morph or whatever where you're basically just a usb stick I haven't the slightest idea. Um, I'll have to look through it. I do have a copy of Transhuman, yeah. so I'll have to check it out. Unfortunately, um, I don't own any of the books, so I was just rolling off of what my uh, the guy who's running it in my group had. So cool. Yeah. I, did, I didn't do a too detailed uh, digging, although I found out that if you want to play a non-human uh, character, which apparently is a thing you can do in this game, you have to roll really high on your first couple of rolls. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for our listeners out there, just for your own edification, uh, Eclipse Phase is kind of this transhuman, almost um, post-cyberpunk game uh, where you can play uh, as a lot of different things, including uh, a character which essentially has no body and is just a, you know, being on the network. Uh, you can also play as an uplifted dolphin or as, as a person in a, um, a morph, which is kind of like a shell, uh, which is a crab. So you can be a crab person, literally. 
it's a pretty neat game. You can walk like crabs and talk like people. Yeah, totally. So, with that, let's just kind of jump right into it. So, yeah, this is sort of a fly by the sea of our pants episode. Uh, but we have gotten some questions recently to our email address, which is darker days radio at gmail.com and we figured we'd uh, just take some time to kind of answer the questions that were sent and kind of brainstorm some ideas so one such question is from oisin um and he was curious if we could talk a little bit more about werewolf the forsaken and uh you know werewolf is a game that we don't touch on too too much on the show it comes up occasionally in a brief segment um of course at our rapid fire back in Darker Days Radio episode number 30, I want to say. And uh, he just was uh, kind of curious, had some questions um, about Werewolf in general. So to kind of kick things off, he was looking for a recommendation, a good uh, SAS adventure to use for Werewolf, just to start off. I can think of, off the top of my head, two great examples. Uh, One of them, of course, is a Werewolf of Forsaken SAS, which is Coyote Falls, um, this SAS kind of deals with a, uh, basically a big bad spirit in the area, uh, but it's attached to a rather innocent person. So that provides a lot of, uh, very interesting moral questions for the characters. Uh, additionally, once you resolve the, uh, the SAS, it actually leaves a very nice territory for your characters, for the player characters, uh, should they like to set up shop there. So it's a very good introduction for a new pack, uh, which is definitely a, a great option. Uh, the other one that I would recommend is probably the uh, Fallen is Babylon uh, SAS. Uh, that's the uh, Inferno tie-in SAS, which uh, I actually used in a uh, previous Darkling, which is our one and only actual play uh, here on the show. Uh, I definitely recommend that one because it's got some interesting options for the werewolves to run into a spirit, well, an Inferno entity, which uh, will will really just kind of not be what they expect to uh, be dealing with when they're so used to being the uh, uh, police of the spirit world. Mm. Uh, Chris, I know you uh, have previously checked out uh, a while back the uh, Parlor Games SAS. So uh, what do you think about that one? So Parlor Games is a uh, the idea of this kind of moving uh, pocket realm that is a, a casino. And, um, and of course, it you know, features the... Uh, some sort of Aslu spirit. I mean, really, I can't, I can't remember too much from the top of my head reading it, but I do know from first impressions it did seem quite a great uh, SAS, um, simply because you could use it for pretty much any of the World of Darkness games beyond just Werewolf. Um, hmm. I was also thinking of it in conjunction of... Uh, there's a small SAS... Um, there's a small SAS scene called uh oh shit i can't remember off my head name uh mike do you know the one for geist which has the character yeah who is, is it, a gambler is it dem bones is that I it i think it's called dem bones yeah. yeah and again it just seemed like you could you could merge those two things together because again there's there's always fun when you're dealing with characters that that are able to uh interact with ephemeral beings where you kind of you know, do a bait and switch. So, you know, for Geist, it's, uh, it's not ghosts, it's spirits. And for Wealth, it's not spirits, it's ghosts. Or, you know, same with Fallen, uh, it's Babylon, it's an Inferno demon. And now we have, you know, from God Machine Chronicles, we've got uh, angels and stuff. And that's actually a good idea, is from, from the actual God Machine Chronicles book, and maybe from uh, from Demon Descent, there could be some interesting ideas of of infrastructures, which... Uh, werewolves, a werewolf pack could, could for some reason come into conflict with, and you know the infrastructure is uh, contaminating and altering the spirit world and the balance between the spirit and material. And once you've dealt with it, you're left with the remnants of this infrastructure that may well make part of the pack's uh, territory and may be a good place for their lair, maybe. Mm, absolutely. It would be very easy to take the God Machine and use that as a sort of, um, you know, worm-like entity if you want to reflect the uh, original World of Darkness. Yeah, you could definitely do that. Um, reading, uh, reading through uh, Demon of the Descent recently, as I was <laughs> literally yesterday, um, there is 
some definite they they do have some good notes on crossover. So compared to Mummy the Curse, Demon the Descent is kind of like screaming, please do some crossover because there is so much to be used in the game. And one of the things is that the God Machine has to has to use a lot of resources to get an angel into our world when it may have less control over them but it can manipulate spirits to perform the same sort of tasks it requires hmm that's very interesting it could bring in a lot of conflict with the uh local uratha Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, you could definitely, and and of course, like it, it just shows how much. Uh, I think that that displays the whole interconnectedness that again, Werewolf has and Werewolf the Forsaken has with all other games. Because when we talk about spirits in Werewolf, we're not just talking about the spirits in in the Hissel in the Shadow, which represent uh, you know concepts and things given manifested forms. You know, the very spirit of death, violence, knives, guns, the river, a tree, a goat, whatever. You know, you've got all those things. And then obviously in, in Mage, you've got a whole plethora of spirits. You've got, um, you've got the spirits that come from, uh, from the Aneros and Teneros. So the, uh, the, the dream realms and the, and the higher places of, of reality to do with the mind. Uh, you also have the spirits, which are basically the Gotia, you know, your internal uh, inner demons brought forth. And of course, that's basically a mage that's a, a, a spirit with mage like abilities that's going to cause havoc um, and can be considered another type of spirit for werewolves to fight against. Um, you have, of course, the spirits from uh, the Abyss, so Abyssal Spirits. And then you've got another great book there, Mike, um, Intruders from the Abyss. So again, you've got these uh, Abyssal intrusions into our reality, and they cause some truly heinous kind of crazy sort of <laughs> things to happen, be it like a lot of body horror and so forth. And they don't conform to the normal rules that werewolves normally expect from spirits. Um, then, of course, here you've got the demons from the Inferno. Uh, you've got angels. You've got the Quashelum, mm -hmm. which again yeah. cause complete havoc. Um, yeah, there's just so much you can do with wealth initially. With there's so much scope, and I think that can be sometimes the main, the the, the core difficulty of wealth is that there is so much scope. Is what is the game really about at its core? And it'll be interesting to see what Idigum Chronicles does for wealth in the same way that Blood and Smoke has done for Vampire. Yeah, I agree. And I was actually just kind of thinking of things in, in the different direction, that when you have the original Werewolf Forsaken core book, it's really just talking about the spirit world and just those, um, you know, basic, you know, shadow spirits uh, that you have going on. However, you know, the, the New World of Darkness has evolved quite a bit since uh, 2005 when that book originally came out, and there are all these different options that we were just mentioning. So it would be interesting to me... Uh, if the Idigum Chronicles would provide a lot more information and detail on how Uratha will deal with these different kinds of uh, uh, non-corporeal entities. Because it seems a little limiting to me to just look at only the spirit world when there's so much going on, which does affect the real world, that the Uratha, these, these forsaken werewolves, can deal with um, and have the ability to. I think, I think the thing there is it really does come down to what is the game really about and I think that's the best place to start on really how you run it because I've got a very mm -hmm. particular way I, w I have run it and I didn't run it for very long as a chronicle but I am keen to run it again and I'm already thinking like you know once I've run you know on my list of things to run is Geist and then most probably after that uh, either mage or maybe werewolf. I think werewolf might be easier to do because because my mage setting in mind is just like too much work to do right now to get it ready. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, where do we begin with all this? <laughs> I don't know. I th I almost thought we were finishing up in some ways, but um, <laughs> yeah, werewolf is a uh, it's. Well, 
how would you run yeah. Werewolf? What in your mind is is uh, uh, the basic kind of Werewolf game? And this is true, I, I would say, for Werewolf of the Apocalypse as well, because I think a lot of the lessons and a lot of the ideas in Werewolf of the Apocalypse, if you strip out the the larger, grander meta plot and, and plot arcs of that setting, and really, you know, you strip it down to what is the core game in there, and then you can comparatively see what Werewolf the Forsaken is and, and what you can borrow and what you can learn from one mm. another there. Yeah, absolutely. Chris, we're getting into dangerous territory here because this is really going to be a, a comparison of, you know, chronicle structure in, in uh, Old World of Darkness and the new, which, I mean, it's, it's a very good thing to uh, kind of go over because it reflects and, and shows some of the uh, the challenges that, you know, new storytellers might have with the new World of Darkness and, and coming up with games. But yeah, all right, I think I can... Uh, I, I will start off by um, talking about how to design a chronicle pretty simply in, uh, in Werewolf the Apocalypse, and then okay. I'll just move over to uh, Werewolf the Forsaken. And uh, Chig, with with regard to the Apocalypse, you're pretty familiar with it, so uh, you know, feel free to uh, jump in here and kind of embellish what I'm talking about. I will be so, more than happy to do so. Absolutely. So with Werewolf the Apocalypse... I'm going to say that your centers of conflict typically are... Uh, antagonist organizations. Uh, you're going to look at really your two basic entities that the um, the guru are fighting against, which is going to be uh, the worm and the weaver. And from there, you kind of have these uh, various little branches that can come out of it. Um, so for the worm, you might put into the local territory. Let's say it's um, the countryside outside of outside of New York City, like the uh, Rage Across New York uh, source book. Uh, you have the seventh generation, which are a, uh, they were a terrible idea now, uh, thinking on them. Uh, they were a, um, organization of Banes and really just evil people who, uh, tortured children, essentially. And that was a big deal for, uh, bringing about, you know, the degradation of human society and, um, the chaos of the worm. Um, so you have them as clear antagonists. You also have Pentex, which is the, uh, monolithic uh, super corporation which is controlled uh, essentially by the worm and uh, is bringing about pollution and uh, destruction of the natural environment. So you have those two kind of centers of conflict um, and it would also be interesting to have those two uh, organizations uh, at odds with each other just to uh, kind of spice things up and give the guru uh, some more options where they can um, uh you know, maybe they'll actually help out the seventh generation, perhaps indirectly, uh, so that they can monkey wrench uh, a Pentex subsidiary or something like that. Uh, from there, you can just put in uh, different NPCs who the Guru might fight against. Um, obviously, Where of the Apocalypse has a lot of combat options in it, um, so that is uh, some some pretty core elements right there. And you'll figure out how all these kind of antagonists connect to the Sept itself. The Sept being the kind of central, um, uh, the, the cairn, uh, and, and linked to the spiritual world in that region. Um, so, for example, in Ridge Cross, New York, there was the uh, Central Park uh, sept. Um, so that could be perhaps the one that you, you work with. Uh, and I think the sept mother there was Mother Larissa, if I remember correctly, who was a pretty cool card in the Rage uh, collectible card game as well. Mm -hmm. so you have those options that's all in the real world and then you have to add the other layer of the spirit world uh throwing in some uh, issues going on there some of the uh shadowy reflections of what's going on uh in the real world and how it's affecting the uh the spirit world which is something that um you also do in in werewolf the forsaken uh chig is there anything i'm missing here um um right off the bat i would say that the biggest uh hurdle that the guru face in uh, the apocalypse is not the worm and it's not the weaver it's other guru yeah exactly, um, exactly. they kind of shot themselves in the foot thousands of years ago when they killed off all their all the other shapeshifters and now they have to do all the jobs and they're not really good at any of them <laughs> right and that's that that is where the uh the big problem in werewolf the apocalypse comes from uh they are pack animals with a pack mentality who don't really like one another much less anyone else yeah absolutely so chick so i think you're right in addition in addition to there being the worm and the weaver 
Um, I always like to throw in a little bit of uh, inter-guru uh, politics in my chronicles. Um, so if you're playing a group of silver fangs, then you have another group of silver fangs who think that they could run things better than you. And another group of silver fangs is backed up by the children of Gaia in the area. But you have the red talons on your side. That's just a whole big mess where in addition to having to go out there and fight the good fight for humanity and uh, Gaia herself, you also have to make sure that while you're out there fighting the good fight, no one's spreading horrible rumors about you behind your back in the in the set. Yeah, absolutely. So the way I'm kind of looking at it, I'm kind of thinking of a almost kind of like a flow chart. So in the middle, you have your own sept. That's kind of your home base. It might have its own, you know, internal politics, that sort of thing. Um, you know, up above that, you have these different organizations, you know, Pentex and the seventh generation uh, and how you interplay with those. And then, you know, below that, south of it, you have maybe two septs which uh, you're in conflict with or have relations with. So perhaps, um, you know, the Central Park sept that you're at it's trying to assert its territory or its ownership over the entire New York State territory. But there's another sept, let's say, up in the, uh, the Catskills, and that is in opposition to them. They also say, hey, we control New York. So you have um, sort of this territorial conflict right there uh, built in, uh, which may you know, come into play with uh, some political backstabbing or even some you know, physical conflict and that sort of thing. So I think that's a very good point. So you can see there's really, from the way I'm describing it, you have your central core group that you are, and then you have, you know, some external antagonists up above and then internal t antagonists below and just kind of start designing things that way. Um, I like to uh, kind of make a almost flow chart. If you've seen some of the older, like Vampire the Masquerade city books, they had these flow charts which showed you the relationships between different NPCs uh, in the city and that sort of thing. And I really like adapting that to... Um, you know, coterie politics and vampire, or just more uh, large-scale politics of a chronicle. You will see examples of that in um, in uh, the Chicago setting book for New Water Darkness, mm. for the werewolf chapter, as well as mage and vampire. Um, and yeah, there's actually a really good sass, there's a good setting, um, is the Chicago setting. Um, you know, it has plenty of packs already um, detailed. And I think it was interesting what Chig was saying was boiling, you know, Boiling down a lot of the conflicts to, you know, not just forget, not to, to the fact that you shouldn't really forget about the interaction between packs themselves because, you know, werewolves are territorial creatures. And in some respects, I think, um, again, uh, maybe what werewolf uh, the uh, Forsaken is doing is focusing more upon that type of story. Uh, and that kind of mentality, in order to in order to deliver a game that really is more about life as a werewolf rather than life as essentially super beings against you know whatever ancient evil or evils you or, or massive corporation you're against, um, mm -hmm. which is where Perhaps. I would say um, again the focus in in uh, Forsaken is is more on the packs and more on your territory, and then the key interactions between who who which other packs does your pack get on with, which other ones do they not get on with, and whose territory do you border with, and is this territory with are those borders uh, with other forsaken packs or are you in the dangerous position that you also have borders with the pure and and it's really uh, i would say forsaken really focus on are uh, is your pack good enough at looking after your territory and if you're not good enough someone's going to come in and you know displace you because obviously territory comes with you know a uh, uh, loci from which you can harvest, you know, essence and, you know, go into the spirit world through. Mm -hmm. um, and also territory comes with access to the people who may well be kin of werewolves and who will in the future, you know, join your pack and join your, or, pos or join your tribe. Um, so, yeah, in that, the, I think that's really, you know, 
the the whole thing really I feel about Forsaken is it's a far more local game than uh, than Forsaken uh, than Apocalypse mm. ever was. Yeah, yeah, I concur. Uh, it definitely is more of a localized game, but I think a lot of the same general chronicle design principles really still apply. Yeah. Um, instead of having these monolithic organizations that you're battling against, instead you're going to be looking at um, more issues with your territory and that sort of thing. So your centers of conflict aren't going to be Pentex, it's going to be um, robberies and how that affects both the mortal world and also the spirit world and the, and the reflections there. So yes. you need to come up with multiple issues with the territory locally and the bordering regions uh, that the worlds have to deal with. And this kind of does make it seem like it's a sandbox game where your player is going to be, uh, you know, uh, affected by these various issues as, this, you know, play sessions progress. But I'd argue that it's not much more sandbox than the original, you know, Werewolf the Apocalypse. Um, it's just that these are more localized effects, which you don't always see visually. You just get hints of them. You'll have to go investigate. And that's another crucial thing. I would say it's more open. It's... Uh, Forsaken, you can I, ideally, I would I, the way I was going to run it anyway, if I <laughs> run it for a longer chronicle or so, is more of a structured sandbox. So obviously, Indeed. you would want to have some sort of overarching story to, you know, get the players involved, get them invested in looking after their territory and why it's important to do so, and why they're in conflict with with these other groups. But at the same time, you you can kind of drop in quite happily, kind of a, a freak of the week episode, which is not really a freak of the week episode. It's more of a, it's your damn job to, you know, deal with these issues in your territory. Um, and in that respect, then you you're beginning to you it, it it's more werewolf is it, the forsaken is looking at how things looking at ripples. So if you don't deal with that murder alley in your territory and don't deal with the fact that more and more spirits of, of, of murder are, are gathering, gathering there and, and, uh, and causing uh, the, the resonance of the place to foster more murders to occur there, you're eventually going to have like an incursion occur where some sort of murderous spirit crosses over possesses someone and goes off on a on a little rampage which then occurs in someone else's territory and then who's in then you know the wells in that territory deal with that murderous uh, uh ridden and they figure out that that spirit uh, all comes back from your territory so you know conflict then comes out of that so it's all looking at how your territory is interconnected with other ones and, and where all these ripples uh, head to and what they cause. Um, so that, I think, is really interesting and, and creates a very kind of, I, I don't know, gives it a very organic feel to the setting. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it might be good to just come up some of the, uh, a couple of example overarching story ideas. Maybe Chris can throw one out that you used in the game or that you have um, planned. Um, yeah, I'll go. I can go with my basic chronicle setup for like a what I call season one because you know I've I've I run sequels to my chronicles when whenever I can because it just saves me having to write more material. Um, sure. So season one of Werewolf is essentially you know you have a new pack and two older packs obviously give over some of their territory and fuse it together and they go here's your territory. Uh, there's a f- and it was set uh, in in um, in a place called uh, on the outskirts of Manchester in the UK, so it borders onto the Pennines and so farmland and and so forth. Because I made the centre of Manchester uh, a complete chaos for werewolves that they can't exist there because the spirits have gone completely mad. So it gives this idea that that the Forsaken are squeezed between the the madness of the city centre and the pure tribes that live out in the wilderness. Hmm, And so your starting tribe is right out on the wilderness, and uh, you've got a little farmhouse or something where the group can call as a communal home. Uh, Characters, one player character had uh, a... um, actually had links to the area, so he had like a, a, a son to look after, 
who was living with with their mother and so and his character was estranged from that but you know obviously had the fear that they could be used against him and his child could be you know one of the forsaken um and really the way the things built up was like first of all they had to deal with more local issues uh, around their their new um their new lair their new farmhouse so dealing with how uh, the local water spirit, the local water was unclean, and that was due to a corruption of the the river spirit, um, and working how, out how that was linked to a larger conflict that was slowly brewing, um, and then they also had to perform. They had to find their first uh, their totem spirit, because as a new pack they didn't have one, and this meant having to go out into uh they 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 i gave them a choice of totem spirits they could have taken and they chose one totem spirit to go after instead and that meant they had to go out into uh territory that was not theirs which was actually pure tribe territory and get a claw of a big cat because obviously in the uk we've got this whole thing of of uh you know alien big cats that roam the uh roam the farmlands hmm. uh, because obviously they've been released from private collections and the there's actually a, a legend of a type of uh, apparition spirit ghost called a striker which is local to uh, manchester which is a type of big cat spiritual entity so that was literally their 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 spirit was this kind of fog like cat like spirit called the striker in the mists and they had to they had to get this claw. They initially had to fight this spirit. Then they had to go off on an errand to get this claw to get renown, so it would then want to to be attached to them. And the poor character who went into the wolf went into the pure tribe territory, obviously got the claw, and then had to leg it as fast as possible out of pure tribe territory as they were being chased uh, by pure tribe werewolves. Um, and then obviously there would have been some more kind of like differences like there was a clock spirit they had to deal with in the town so there had been a numerous kind of like deaths due to this uh, clock tower uh, so people apparently having accidents but it wasn't and eventually this all would grow into the whole thing that there was an, an old god literally called the older man which again is attached to some mythology and uh, uh in Manchester so he was awakening and finding and was angry that all the coal had been mined out of his out of his hillsides and been used to obviously in the industrial revolution for the city of Manchester and uh, he wanted revenge which is literally uh, for him would be uh, causing the corruption and degradation of the very city itself so he had this massive kind of literal godlike spirit waking up and using other spirits for its own uh its own purposes so again like uh bog uh bogget holes so boggins are types of spirits in in manchester uh and so rather than being fey creatures you know they're they're spirits of uh chaos which um you have to fight against um so yeah you know i had stuff like that um that i wanted to kind of do and into conflict between different tribes and uh you know have have them come up against uh you know get employed by a bunch of vampires to uh do some do a, a simple job because obviously in in forsaken there is no immediate reason why werewolves and vampires have to be at each other's throats yeah absolutely i like it Chris. Well, That's very interesting. except for vampires you know they like to beat other people's throats well, yeah, but like, <laughs> not, uh, yeah, obviously, but but I think that's the one good thing in in uh, in New World of Darkness is that you can quite happily have a bunch of say, uh, you know, Carthian vampires come up to these uh, werewolves and be like, look, we need some muscle, and you know, we'd like you to do this for us. Uh, what do you need in exchange? And you know, of course, the werewolves are like, well, um, we have trouble getting access to this could you do that for us and you know everyone's happy because the werewolves the the vampires suddenly you know are facing facing down their rival coterie and they've got backup like serious backup and the werewolves in return 
get access to things they normally wouldn't have access to. And, uh, or, you know, there's, there's various things you could do uh, in that way. Um, like interactions between werewolves and... Uh, so in my setting, because my vampire setting obviously crosses over with my werewolf setting, so there is a mutual respect between the cult of Synonos, which is the uh, Celtic uh, cult of uh, the Circle of the Crone that exists in the city, and numerous of the packs of werewolves, because some of them have similar heritage that to the point that they they have respect for each other but also they also the wells also have to keep an eye on the circle of chrome because they know that the circle of chrome are able to unwittingly uh summon spirits into the mortal world into the mortal world and of course that causes all hell to be unleashed so i've got uh, a couple ideas myself um, just throwing them out there far less detailed than chris's were but one story idea you could run with is um uh, particularly based around two characters, two new werewolves in the city. So let's say if there's a new pack, you have five players. Uh, three of them will be from an existing pack. Maybe they just lost a couple in some conflict with a, with a spirit. And then two of the players are new werewolves. Uh, they're ghost wolves, and uh, not too well known in the area, but uh, because this other pack indeed some people, they are, are eventually accepted. Of course, there's always a bit of an air of mystery about them because uh, they haven't been uh, not too well known in the area, as I mentioned before, and they kind of keep themselves uh, and, and don't really want to talk about their past. Of course, the secret is that they were previously part of the pure tribes. Uh, maybe they were young uh, worlds that were inducted in and saw, saw what was going on and didn't really like it. So they got out of there and then found a way to this new city. Uh, of course, the issue going on uh, is that a lot of the kind of sandbox, structured sandbox elements that you see with the uh, uh, werewolf game that you're playing are actually caused due to these werewolves. Uh, of course, the pure have um, certain predilections when it comes to spirits, and perhaps some angry spirits followed these two characters to the new city and are wreaking havoc because, well, they see them as uh, still part of the pure and are, uh, uh, as such, uh, causing trouble, whether targeting them or those they know. Um, so a lot of the story will be just uh, coming to the realization that these two characters were previously from the pure and figuring out how they can be accepted into the uh, greater Uratha society. Um, and also just the challenges of keeping things in order uh, in the pack's territory. So that's one little idea right there. Uh, another one I was coming up with was, uh, you know, when you look at like RPG.net and all these other places, there's always that one guy who says, oh yeah, Werewolf of Forsaken, that's just Ghostbusters, the role-playing game. Which is, you know, clearly a, uh, not a very good description, you know, to people that have actually read and uh, uh, played Werewolf of Forsaken. But that got me thinking a little bit. And I know, Che, you're a big Ghostbusters fan yourself, so uh, listen to this. I'm listening. Uh, this could also be used in uh, Werewolf the Apocalypse, by the way. What if there was a pack, maybe a small group, maybe a, a lodge for Werewolf of Forsaken, that was capturing spirits they were literally doing what the ghostbusters do and because of this since they had these spirits trapped they could force them to teach them gifts whenever they wanted um maybe they could make this a service to some more uh, unsavory uratha or guru uh they really needed some particular uh gift or or other ability so uh they go to this lodge or tribe and then well they can have the uh they can force the spirit to teach that gift um, obviously this is going to cause many issues in the, uh, the spirit world. Um, it's going to make people pretty pissed because, uh, whether it be other spirits that worked with, say, a, um, a water spirit that's now gone missing, they'll be perhaps looking for, um, their associate of sorts. Uh, but maybe other spirits could come into the territory and, uh, try to fill in the voids. Maybe because there's no water spirit a uh, toxin spirit comes in and starts polluting the river, uh, and something like that. So I think it's an idea that you could run with, um, maybe not as the core story, but another kind of cool uh, antagonist to use in your World of the Apocalypse game. Or or ally, if you're playing very unsavory Uratha. <laughs> cool. You like it, Chig? I do. I like that a lot. Um, yeah. Because generally, to bind a spirit, you have to make a deal with it and offer it this, that, and the other, but... Uh forcefully binding a nature spirit so that you can make it do things for you and then dealing with the consequences of that that's a that could be a whole 
little session of or a, a whole section of a chronicle. I think um, something else uh, I I kind of like an aspect that's I think um, turns up a bit in Apocalypse, but I think is a more of a major thing in um, in uh, Forsaken is the ridden and the possessed. So these are humans that are you know obviously possessed by spirits, and the reason spirits do this is because they can obviously uh, experience the mortal uh what it's like to be a human more and they do so in extreme ways you know they they do things you wouldn't expect like you know they a person is possessed by a spirit and quite happily puts their hand in boiling water just to feel it um and you know these these creatures can can lead to essentially kind of look can can look a bit like um, some of them. Obviously, they're animal based. Can look like uh, other types of shapeshifters, and then some of these can also be uh, are treated literally as like small gods by the Circle of the Crone, or um, or could be uh, creatures that could be put to use by the God Machine. You know, the God Machine may well be. Uh, for example, the God Machine may well be wanting these creatures to cut these ridden to be created because it has to harvest them, harvest something specific from them, a particular organ uh, for its next, uh, for use in its next occult matrix. And of course you know, the creation of these creatures leads to uh, an imbalance in, uh, in between the spirit and, and material world and causes too much blending and uh, something like that. Um, yeah. Nice. I like it. All right, that gives us some story ideas. Do we have anything else we need to discuss about uh, Werewolf the Apocalypse or Werewolf the Forsaken? I think you can play Werewolf the Forsaken as a really horrific version of The Sims, where you really try and focus on how this pack lives together and what things they have to deal with, rather than looking at too large a plot to begin with. You know, how do they, you know, get a real good feel for how they, you know, look after their home, look after their family members, look after their territory, deal with the police, deal with the police not looking into certain things when they should do, uh, you know, those kind of things and, and the spirits that get born out of uh, all those imbalances. And then from there, once you've really got, uh, I think once you've established, and a lot of that stuff doesn't have to be established in game. I think a lot of these things can be established uh, by blue booking. So, you know, you can, you can have your online you know, repository of, of story material uh, that your group writes. Of course, that means getting your group of players to write more than a bloody paragraph, which is often <laughs> like getting blood yeah. out of a stone. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm rather blessed because Sam here will happily write metric tons of material for her, for her characters, yet getting anyone else to do something just seems like asking too much. Um, yeah, yeah. But it does help because... It means you, when you have that body of material, you quite you you can very quickly establish what the pack feels like without having to to maybe do this in game. And then in game, you can focus on the more abnormal events because a lot of this stuff, like dealing with certain spirits, is pretty much part and parcel of what your werewolves are going to do week in week out. Like, oh look, you know. There's been too many too many accidents on this cor- on this on this uh, corner of road out in the countryside. Uh, we should really check it out. And you know, you discover there's a car spirit that's going up and down the road and needs to be dealt with. Um, and because obviously it's it's fostering cars to go faster or go out of control. But that's rather. I, I think those type of stories, as much as you should look at them, should also be considered. The mon- to, to a certain extent, you need to establish what is mundane for your werewolves, what, what is considered normal, a normal task, and then you can you can once you've got that mood and theme, you can then build from that and look at what is abnormal for them. So you know when you know the pure tribe starts doing something that hasn't been hap- you know hasn't happened in two decades, or or a type of spirit that's never been seen. In since ancient times turns up and starts causing havoc. 
I gotcha. Yeah, I like it. Uh, the other option to look at is maybe kind of following a structure similar to the X Files or um. Oh yeah, yeah. Or you know, Supernatural, where you have the Monster of the Week episodes. You know, that's where you're dealing with that session. But then you have more mythology kind of episodes, uh, and working that way, um, which kind of gives you some room to, you know, slowly develop a story uh, over the course of your chronicle, rather than you know having them go off to you know start off in Manchester and then go off to Scandinavia to investigate some spirit of some sort and then going to Germany and then winding up in Venice. And yeah, that thing. kind of that kind of gallivant, you know, globe trotting, I don't Indeed. really it doesn't really to me fit the feel of Forsaken. And I think it actually if you went off globe trotting like that, I think in Forsaken that kind of travelling round is really looked down upon by other werewolf packs unless you've got a a really good reason to do so. Indeed, indeed. And then you're not going to have your territory when you get back, and then you also, it would be kind of interesting for a game, because you'd have all these issues with trying to cross through the territory of others. Are you going to try to sneak through, announce your presence, uh, what kind of issues are going to come up while you're just staying in uh, one area for a short amount of time? Could be kind of neat. Oh yeah, I think it's definitely its own its own type of it would be its own type of chronicle, that one. And uh, I think you would have to establish the pack as maybe part of uh, a lodge that is known for this sort of, f- sort of, uh, you know, traveling around. Mm. Yeah, definitely. That could be kind of neat. Cool. Um, so I guess that's probably it for Werewolf the Forsaken. Uh, do we want to try to touch on mage seekings just a little bit because there's another question about that mm-hmm. i don't know what are you thinking chig uh, we could i haven't seen the question about it yet but uh, it's on facebook or oh, i can't even remember where we got asked it <laughs> i'm not on facebook you used to be for like a hot minute yes a hot minute okay all right cool i can totally figure this out um <clears throat> this is from michael brazens Maybe you guys could do a little section on Seekings and Mage the Ascension over the different levels of a mage's progression somewhere in the future. I think that is where most storytellers could use some inspiration. I do, anyway. All right, so, Michael, let's see if we can tackle this. And by we, I mean mostly Chig, because I didn't even know these things existed until I saw this email. Uh, Seekings, I I can't remember how I ran them um, as well. Yeah. Anyway. Seekings are really best done one on one, in my opinion. Well, let's start over. For those who don't know what a seeking is, like for instance, Mike, um, yep. as your mage progresses in enlightenment and becomes more and more in tune with how the universe actually works, uh, you will at one you will eventually want to spend some of your experience points on raising your uh, Erite score. Uh, when you do that, uh, your avatar. Uh, comes to your mage or however your mage and your avatar interact and they have what amounts to a discussion on uh, how the universe works and how they can more deeply connect to it. Uh, There are different kinds of avatars and there are different kinds of mages and there are different kinds of traditions and uh, all that so no real no seekings are going to be the same between any any two mages and any two uh, avatars. Uh, so basically, uh, what a seeking is is you spend your XP and you get to have a little role playing scene with your uh, storyteller who takes the part of your avatar, and you have a discussion uh, where he plays the avatar and you play the mage, and you figure out how your mage plugs into reality a little bit deeper. And like I said, it really depends entirely on the mage and the avatar. Um, if you're playing a son of Ether, who uh, his awakening when he first became a mage uh, was he was kidnapped by aliens and they did crazy experiments on him, then um, a seeking could be, hey, the aliens come back and they do more crazy experiments on you. Um, if you're playing a uh, Order of Hermes mage whose uh, avatar is some previous great magus from the past... Uh, then maybe you uh, have a little trance session and you speak to your avatar and he teaches you more about the ways of the universe. It's really difficult to generalize how Seekings work. Yeah, Seekings card, uh, one that 
comes to mind, I ran for one player of mine. This was back. Whoa, this was back when I was still in uh, before university. Wow. Um, the seeking was for a virtual adept, and I can't remember the. Uh, I can't remember what type of avatar they had, because you could be one of four types. Yeah, there's a yeah. questing and uh, dynamic pattern, dynamic primordial and questing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And um, essentially, the seeking was to establish the idea that uh, try and teach. You can you can use it as a way, also as a subtle maybe a subtle way to teach uh, players things, uh, maybe for role play purposes as well. So. Um, in this sense, in this case, it was kind of teaching his uh, for his character that sometimes um, the best form of action is inaction, and so it was this whole thing of like as much as uh, as more. It was kind of putting his character into uh, a position where he, he felt he was in some of a pocket dimension, and he tried to use whatever magic he could to escape it. But as he did so. You know, the pocket dimension became darker and darker and darker, and you know it took him a, a bit to realize, you know, that every time he was doing something, it was causing the place to become less and less real uh, until he finally was like, well, maybe I should just, you know, he was like, I should, my character just stops then and and tries to meditate, and from that realizing that the the lesson was inaction being. A form of action in its own right, and not having to rush into things and just seeing how things develop. So you can use seekings in that way to kind of try and deliver a sort of a, a philosophical message that you think maybe that is important to the character, and it, and it doesn't need to just be a lesson that you, as the storyteller, needs to kind of give. It could be if you've got maybe more aware players players that are more happy to uh, put their characters into difficult scenarios for drama purposes rather than trying to win the game then they may already know what the weakness of the character is and think and deem it is then an appropriate time to address that weakness uh, as part of the growth of their character mm -hmm. yeah yeah um, it's definitely a good time for character growth and development um, but like you said that really does take very engaged players who know how they want their character to grow and how they want their character to develop um, it's mage is just not a game for passive players really no no yeah I think you can also play it so obviously if you've got if you don't do it as one-on-one -on -one, you can have the other players there but there the difference is that you can draw the other players in to be uh, characters within this kind of mystery play that is taking take that is that is happening then the the quick thing you really then need to do is obviously have a bunch of players that aren't assholes um and you take them outside <laughs> the room for a bit you tell them what the agenda of the of the seeking is so that they can then fulfill the role of that of that uh of that character within this mystery play um i think I, off the top of my head i can't remember because I've, obviously i've not read much more of Mage the Awakening recently, but you have some sort of similarities in that as well, where uh, a character can go on an internal quest to, uh, as they to, uh, to, uh, to confront their inner demons. So that's their go -tier. or they, or they try and meet their their daimon, which is kind of a, which is again fulfills the same role as say, say uh, an avatar. And again, they they meet them on some astral plane and you know play chess with them or something like that and learn something about who they are and how reality works. Um, so yeah, you you just yeah you can't passive, but yeah, you're right. Having a passive player and a seeking just ain't gonna happen. <laughs> well, um, they kind of provide for that in the uh, in the game where if you just lay back and don't do anything and you're a very passive player then you're seeking fails and you don't connect deeper to the universe here's your xp back try try again later yeah yeah so i mean they kind of you know they covered they covered that nice i like it uh anything else to discuss on seekings just watch enough there... surreal movies to get ideas yeah. for it. like um get, get, get some symbology down <laughs> yeah so films like you know 
you could even say bits out of like Fight Club or The Fountain, Pie Faith in Chaos, uh, The Cell, uh, you know, any of those really kind of cerebral kind of weird films will give you visual kind of ideas of how to kind of show what a seeking is like. Anything by David Lynch. Oh, yeah, that's well, of course. Indeed. Yeah. There we go. All right, excellent. And on that, I think that's it for this Darkling episode. So, um, of course, we are Darker Days Radio. You can check us out at uh, darker-days.org. Uh, send us an email uh, if you want to ask a similar question for uh, another feedback episode like this or f- something for us to cover at the beginning of an episode. Uh, send it over to darkerdaysradio at gmail.com. Uh, the other good place to uh, hang out and talk to us is, of course, on Google+, Plus at our G+, Plus community. Just search for Dark Days Radio on Google+, Plus and you will find us. Uh, they really need to make a better way for us to link, like plus.google.com slash darkerdaysradio, but they haven't done that yet, I don't think. Not for communities, no. Yeah, not for communities. Individuals. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because we have our community page. We have our um, Darker Days... Uh, uh, you can say business page on Google Plus. Mm-hmm. That yep. exists, uh, and you know, Derek Day exists, who's our kind of <laughs> manifestation <laughs> of Dark Days as a person on uh, on Google Plus. Um, but it does its, it does the job. Totally, lots of good stuff. And of course, we still have a contest ongoing. We've actually only had four submissions, and that's not enough. Uh, we're running a contest for a copy of, uh, for Vampire the Requiem, the Strix Chronicles, Blood and Smoke, which is a, uh, basically the new updated chronicle and setting for, for uh, Vampire the Requiem. A uh, really great book, very well received, and uh, we're giving away a free hard copy of that. All you have to do is send an email over to uh, darkerdaysradio at gmail.com and just uh, say what vampire we would be or what would be our favorite. So, you know, maybe Chris is a uh, setite. Uh, maybe <laughs> Chig is a setite. And maybe Mike is um, a of serpent Osiris. of light. Oh, Order of Osiris. Yeah, Order yeah, Children of Osiris, of Osiris. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that could be it. Um... Oh, and of course, uh, yeah, we've got, I've done some more stuff. I finally wrote something new for the uh, Darker Days blog. So that's, you can just look for Darker Days Radio uh, on Blogspot. So that's uh, the Google blogger thing. Um, yep. Spaghetti so Westerns wrote, in Imarin. Yeah, Spaghetti Westerns in Imarin. Yeah, did you read that, Mike? I started to, yep. Yeah, definitely yeah. a lot of good ideas there. Um, it's very fitting for the uh, Iron Kingdoms universe. I mean, you just just the setting itself is built for it. I mean, you have a wilderness, you know, kind of a frontier. Uh, you have trains. You've got guns. I mean, you've got all the, uh, the really, the, uh, the, the elements of, you know, the background and, and the dressings of the setting right there built into the game. So it really just seems like it's a perfect fit. Yeah, and I think the reason why I kind of liked doing that one is because, uh, writing that, it's because I think you can run a more it'd be interesting to run Iron Kingdoms as a more sandbox game, and I think the Western kind of represents that if you've, say, got a group of characters that are very much like in Werewolf the Forsaken looking after their land where they've mm. got their herd of of, of uh, bison or whatever they call, whatever the troll can... Is it Tuffaloes? They call their bison? Mm-hmm, yep. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they're looking after that and, you know, you've got the one character who is who has the money and everything the other character is like say ha, is a uh, friends with them but is actually the local sheriff who and so use the uh the military captain career for it uh to represent being you know that type of person and, you know stuff like that so um i think it'd be kind of fun to play a western plus you know a badass in a long coat with um with <laughs> with mage lock pistols Totally, totally. Awesome Sounds like stuff. the Red Steel campaign. Oh, God, no. Just let's get out of here. <laughs> let's get out of here. Uh, sure, Chig, you know what? We note. can do another Darkling in the future talking about awful D&D campaign settings. <laughs> there are more than a few. Mm-hmm, yep. Cool. All right, I think that's it for this episode of Darker Days Radio. Well, Darkling for Darker Days Radio. Uh, if you want to send in your own Darkling... You know, go right ahead. Just uh, send us a you know MP3 over at darkerdaysradio at gmail dot com, and uh, we'll gladly uh, play it on the air. Maybe you want to talk about um, something that we don't cover enough. Maybe 
Well, we've had a lot of requests for uh, Kindred of the East, so I'm slowly working through that book. Hopefully get uh, into it in the future. But maybe you know quite a bit about Mummy the Resurrection. You want to share that. Uh, please go ahead and uh, send it in. So with that, uh, I think we're done with the show. And uh, yeah, everybody, good night. <laughs> Thank you.